Okay, so we're going to be talking about the 2030 Equitable Climate Action Plan. Uh, this is uh, put out by o uh, Oakland. Uh, this was something that was created uh, in 2018 uh, that uh, was done through a, a major uh, community outreach process. Uh, and this is actually uh, the, the second ECAP that uh, Oakland has put through, the first one being the 2020 uh, Energy Climate and Action Plan. So, so the Equitable Climate Action Plan is focused on greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. So the main, the main goal of it is to actually reduce our greenhouse gas uh, emissions uh, you can see our goal is to get below 30, 36%, and that's a, of a 2005 baseline emission levels by 2020. And what I understand, we have hit that goal. Uh, we want to, by 2030, be at 56% of our emissions levels, 2005. And by 2050, we want to be at 83%. So the the Equitable Climate Action Plan, as I said, it used to be the Energy and Climate Action Plan, but this time around they decided they really wanted to have a strong focus on equity and justice. And so to get to that part, they had a couple of steps, which had the formation of the Department of Race and Equity in 2016, that worked alongside folks to make sure that this was uh, implemented well. Uh, they adopted 2030 greenhouse reduction target and engage the most heavily impacted neighborhoods in a community driven process, which we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like later. They established the ECAP ad hoc community advisory committee, which was a gr group of advisors that were focused on um, and that were community members and folks who represented uh, community based organizations that came on to advise uh, as to how to implement equity into every aspect of this plan. Uh, there's also was the passing of the Climate Emergency and Just Transition Re Resolution in 2018, which uh, puts the city uh, on goal to uh, develop a just transition strategy for the climate emergency. And in 2019, there was the passing of the Green New Deal Resolution, which sets to support the national uh, Green New Deal le legislation that's been put forth by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. So the focus of the 2030 ECAP has been on social, racial, and economic equity. So there's two questions we have here, which is how do we stop climate change and how do we adapt to climate change? To stopping the climate change, we looked at local emissions, life cycle emissions, and carbon removal, which we'll talk a little bit more in a second. And to how do we adapt, they looked at issues of resilient infrastructure, resilient communities, and resilient government. So this is a 10 year plan to get to our 56% level uh, and in a way that will increase equity and reduce racial disparities across the city in theory. So the city of Oakland tracks two types of greenhouse gas emissions, local emissions and life cycle emissions. So local emissions are emissions that occur within the city. So they can they mean like something directly, like you drive your car in the city and the exhaust that comes from your car pipe is a local emission. Uh, if you are using your electricity within the city, that is a local emission. They're, those are the easiest emissions to measure uh, and to uh, address throughout the city. Life cycle emissions are local emissions plus emissions that occur throughout the world to support activities. So it can be manufacturing, mining, packaging, transportation, all of that goes into uh, life cycle emissions. So if you imagine somebody in Oakland orders a product uh, online, the life cycle emissions for that project or product go to how was it made? How was it manufactured? Where did the supplies come from? How was it shipped to Oakland? And then also what happens at the end of life to that program? How is it disposed of? These emissions are harder to measure and are impacted by many factors outside of the city's control. So you can see that life cycle emissions are three times greater than local emissions. And uh, this is the breakdown of where we're seeing uh, our uh, local emissions and life cycle emissions come from. You can see for local emissions, the bulk are coming from transportation with buildings being this, uh, the next biggest one. And we have waste in the port. Uh, 
coming from it. And when you look at life cycle emissions, transportation is a large portion of it, but material consumption and waste, um, that being like, what do you know, things that we buy, things that we uh, use and things that we throw away are equally on par with transportation and then buildings and port being the next ones. So there are five principles that get guided the development of the ECAP, ensuring that the plan is equitable, ambitious, realistic, balanced, and adaptive. In terms of being equitable, they have uh, many ECAP themes to, uh, that were critical to increasing equity in our system. So principles of environmental justice, civic engagement, housing security, public health, green jobs, resilience, and food, food security specifically. Uh, it's the equitable climate, action plan is ambitious in that it's prioritizing a deep decarbonization. So when they did a preliminary analysis, you can see this Bloomberg Associates. Uh, this was an analysis of where the greenhouse gases uh, reductions um, can best come from in Oakland. So uh, they identified five strategies needed to reach climate targets. One was decarbonizing the electric grid, uh, which we're doing through the East Bay uh, clean energy, uh, eliminating fossil fuels from building and heating. So that's like getting natural gas out of uh, buildings. One of the targets that they look at is getting rid of gas stoves and gas heating facilities from buildings, uh, improving insula insulation and windows in buildings, moving away from private auto trips, um, going more to public transportation, and electrifying all remain remaining vehicles. So there's a goal to get uh, uh, all our cars moved into electric vehicles in, as part of this plan. So realistic, it means pursuing actions that are cost effective and within the city sphere of control. So, so that we can reach our 2030 ECAP target. So realistically meaning, you know, this, this as a plan, uh, they had to look at, uh, issues of you know what is what are they able to implement and what it what is actually feasible for them to do as a city to get to their as you can see their 2030 goals so i should say my uh experience with developing the ecap was as someone who was doing outreach to get community members more involved the ecap was developed through having eight community workshops uh, one in each district of Oakland. We uh, ha actually hired on people such as myself to go out and do outreach within the community to get them get people to these community workshops. Uh, and at the workshops, folks actually like put out put out list of things that they wanted to see happen in the plan, and went and went through a voting system to kind of vote as to what their priorities were. There were also climate equity work days where folks came out and did some hands-on work in the community, like doing gardening, things like that. They held several stakeholder meetings. They had pop-up engagement at uh, events. Uh, there was an online survey, an online portal, social media. They put the draft online for public review. Um, and they also had two town halls after the, the first draft was put forward. Uh, in total, they talked to about 1,200 residents through these various uh, uh, events uh, in the city of Oakland to get their opinion on how to do uh, this right. Uh, to further embed equity into the plan, they included data-driven analysis. Uh, they worked with the equity facilitator who's, uh, she was mentioned earlier, Mar Maribel Tobias uh, and, and the ad hoc community advisory com committee to make sure that uh, that equity was woven throughout the plan. They had oversight from the race and uh, equity department. And there was a racial equity impact assessment that goes along with the plan that is basically an analysis of each section of the plan to make sure uh, that to, to illustrate where uh, equity could be interwoven and to have an implementation guide as to how, when we're implementing this plan, we can make sure it's done with equity. There are seven different sections to the um, Equitable Climate Action Plan. The first is transportation and use. 
So looking at reducing vehicle miles traveled through active mobility, public transportation and vehicle electrification, uh, building in energy. So eliminating fossil fuels from, from buildings and also from our energy supply, material consumption and waste, uh, which is looking at supporting a cir circular economy so that you know whatever we use goes back um, uh, uh, and is done in a circular way, minimizing single use plastics, eliminating organic landfill and reducing food insecurity. Looked at issues of adaptation, which we'll talk a little bit more about, but um, we're looking at increasing community and facility resilience, increasing green infrastructure and understanding vulnerabilities. Carbon removal, which refers to things like planting trees, increasing urban forestry, carbon farming, and exploring other opportunities. Um, six is port leadership. So working with the port to reduce direct and indirect emissions. And finally, seven is city leadership, which is to reduce fossil fuel dependence and innovate through leadership and launch the Oakland Climate Action Network, which uh, so the, the, it's interesting because the Oakland Climate Action Network is the idea of having uh, local citizens who are hired to go out and talk to the community about the Equitable Climate Action Plan and help to implement the strategies in the uh, uh, Equitable Climate Action Plan. And actually the Shoreline Leadership Academy is largely based on this idea of like having uh, residents who are going to learn about all of these issues and then kind of teach the community and do outreach from the community on this. So a lot of what you guys are doing was born out of that idea. So for the racial equity impact assessment and implementation guide, uh, it was developed by uh, EJ Solutions. Uh, it included a preliminary equity screen of all of the different elements of the um, plan. Uh, it included equity-based key performance indicators, and it talked about best practices and equitable engagement, including guidance for how to start the Oakland Climate Action Network. So it says it doesn't happen without community leadership. Obviously, you know, in order to implement a plan like this, we need help from all, all across the city. So here's some of the organizations that they worked with, Grid Alternatives, the Scraper Bike Team, Food Shift, uh, and there are various other organizations across the city that not only helped to develop the plan, but now are, are looking to help to implement uh, its actions. So in order to achieve carbon neutrality by 2045, we uh, are looking at uh, the main points of transportation, reducing electrifying building and vehicles. Uh, so buildings, we're working with the East Bay uh, Community Energy, which is our local energy provider, uh, which the East Bay Community Energy actually works to get green our electricity supply, um, helping us to get more of our electricity supply from renewables overall. Um, for waste, we're looking at zero organics to landfill, so more composting, more diversion of uh, food waste from the landfill um, and then carbon removal, um, looking to have negative emissions by 2045 through urban forestry, proactive tree maintenance, and carbon farming, which uh, I don't know if you guys know right now, but there's an urban forestry master plan that's being uh, put forward that's doing a, a calculation of all of the trees in the city and all the places where we need to put trees and going, putting together a plan for how we're going to reforest Oakland. Okay, so that's the end of that one. Do you guys have questions about the Equitable Climate Action Plan? Yeah, uh, yes, I do have a question. Sure. And the question has to do with your live, uh, last slide. Okay. What is carbon farming? Carbon farming, it's, I mean, it's when you do certain things in order to take carbon out of the air. So you can do it with trees. Uh, there, there are other things that will, uh, that take carbon out of the air, like algae. Um, but it's basically, you are creating uh, areas uh, that have vegetation that can take the carbon out of the air. Okay, good enough. Cool. 
Any other questions? Okay. Well, if we are done with that, I want to introduce I have a question. Oh yeah, go ahead. Um, the list of community outreach events that you had. Yes. Um, can you say more about that? Like, where did you uh, target? Where did you host these events? Like the pop up. What was that? Uh, like, did you have a time period you did that in? And yeah. Uh, what were some of like? Was there a specific team, or was that kind of like all hands on deck? Everyone was doing that. That's like, it's great that you're asking this question because this is actually what I, I know the most about <laughs> in all of this too. So uh, so they, they had the equity consultants that I referenced. Uh, there was two uh, folks who were hired on to be equity consultants and they were in charge of doing community outreach. And as part of that, they hired about 20 community members to go out and flyer in the neighborhoods um, to go talk to major uh, like other organizations. So like we, we went and talked to local groups uh, to, to turn out people to these meetings. So the first eight meetings happened within about a couple months of each other, like three months of each other uh, in the different um, uh, council districts. So you would have like a meeting at a local uh, school or a, a, a local um, like nonprofit. And we before we had the meeting, the folks who were hired on to go do outreach would go into the community, do outreach, invite people to the meeting. Uh, those meetings were kind of like uh, brainstorms where folks would kind of put up uh, ideas for what it is that they want to see as part of the Equitable Climate Action Plan. And after we, we get all kinds of ideas put up on papers all around the community, around the, well, the, the auditorium, wherever we were, then we would give them all like stickers and they could put stickers on what are their like priorities. And through that, we could see like who the community members like main priorities were for it. Uh, and that kind of informed what was put into the Equitable Climate Action Plan. Um, and then like for the, the pop-ups, it would be like, you know, if there was a festival that was out, then people would go and table. Um, after the, after we had all the meetings with the community members, then the plan got written. And then we came back for a town hall me meetings where the plan was presented to the community and the community was allowed to have comment on it and to talk about what they felt was missing or what they felt could be done differently. Uh, and then there was like a public comment period where folks could go online and they could read the plan. Um, and then there was also the ad hoc community uh, advisory committee that met on a monthly basis and reviewed what was going on with the plan. And that, that was also open to the public, like the public could come and actually make public comments and watch that meeting. Um, so yeah, sort of like, it was a pretty extensive uh, community engagement process. Uh, I still think, you know, I, I still think it could be more in depth, but it's probably one of the more in depth community engagement process I've seen. Uh, 1200 people in a city of 420,000 is not a lot, but it's honestly 1200 people advising on a, a, on a document is more than you usually see when you have government community engagement processes. Uh, Hope, did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. That was awesome. Thank you. No problem. All right. Any other questions? A uh, Phoenix, wh where where is it now? It always seems like there's a, a a new status of where it's at. I guess um the um the 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 goal that was met that that was made already. You said 2030 was met, and now yeah. it's the. I mean, were there any any disappointments? Because I know that. Being on the inside, I, I had heard some, you know, some things that weren't exactly gotten from what was what the community wanted. And I, I just don't have any evidence of to speak to that, but I just want to know where it's at and if you're you're satisfied with it. <laughs> I'm <laughs> never satisfied. <laughs> it could be better. Um, and, and you know, there, there's a lot of drawbacks to this plan, one of them being like um there's just not a lot of money to implement it. And this is something you see consistently with plans is they'll, they'll put together these really big plans, but they won't know where the funding's gonna come to yeah. make any of it happen. 
and the the organization that uh, or the the part of the department of the um, city that actually put this plan together and is responsible for implementing it has about two maybe three staff members and the plan is huge right so like there's 40 there's there's seven different sections but there's 40 different targets within it so you know if you can imagine like even just putting together the Oakland Climate <laughs> Action Network is a huge endeavor in and of itself like they have to fundraise for it they have to implement the program, you know, that could be one to three people implementing that in and of itself. But mm -hmm. for each of these, each of these sections, they only have a couple of people working on it. So they did just recently send out a message saying, hey, it's the anniversary of the Equitable Climate Action Plan and kind of listed some of the things that they've done. Um, you know, they, I, if you want, I can forward that on to people and we can, you can see that. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're getting, they're getting there, you know, they're getting some parts of it done, but I think in terms of getting all aspects of it done, we're just going to need to see a lot more funding coming to the city to make that happen. Mm. Thank you. No problem. I'm looking for, for any, anything in the email. I, I do get, um, I do get the message where Place for Sustainable Living is a partner, um, yeah. you know, since, I guess, when, since they did this 2018. Cool. Okay, if, is there any more questions? No, good, perfect timing. Great, okay, so I'm gonna introduce our next two speakers who are with the City of Oakland Planning Department. So Lakshmi Rajagopalan, is a planner with the City of Oakland Planning and Building Department with a background in land use and sustainable mobility in India and California. She is the housing element lead for the general plan update, which we're gonna talk about next. And also Deanna Perez Dominic is a planner with the City of Oakland Planning and Building Department with a background in health equity, sustainability and community engagement in California. She's the environmental justice element lead for the general plan update. So welcome, you guys. Um, they're going to talk to us about the general plan. Appreciate you coming out here today. Well, thanks so much, Phoenix, for having us. Thank you so much for having us. And we also have another. Do you want to kick us off, Lakshmi? <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> we Our, also um... Can you hear me? <clears throat> oh, sorry. Maybe there's a lag on my side. Uh, can everyone hear me? Can you just uh, Phoenix? Yeah, okay. So we also have another colleague, uh, <clears throat> Daniel Finley, who's the safety element lead, but he also helped us with the presentation, but he couldn't be here because of prior commitments. So uh, I can share my screen, right, uh, Phoenix? <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so we wanted to start with staff are working on a short video, uh, a series of videos on the general plan update uh, to, uh, as, to kickstart the process. So I wanted to start with that and then uh, go into the presentation. <clears throat> Hello, Oakland. Residents of Oakland have great pride in our city, valuing and celebrating its cultural richness and diversity. That said, it has been 20 years since we've updated our general plan to reflect all that Oakland is and can be. Today, we want to introduce you to Oakland's general plan and how it affects everyone in Oakland. A general plan for the city of Oakland means that we will have an opportunity over the next several years to work together through community engagement, through technical expertise, through different affinities of concern around open space, around housing, around transportation, around environmental justice, which is a new component for the general plan, this iteration, in order to really craft a common vision of how we see the city moving forward for years ahead. And it will give guidance both in terms of policies, programs, uh, and specifically give us a baseline for the city's land use and for the city's development according to those visions and intentions that come through the update process to the general plan. Oakland's own legacy of colonialism, injustice, structural racism, and discriminatory practices have created inequities in our city, specifically for Black Americans and other communities of color. 
Those inequities continue to result in profoundly disparate outcomes in economics, education, health, and more. Most parts of the city's current general plan, the guiding document for Oakland's future, were developed in the 1990s and did not recognize or address these aspects of Oakland's history. This is about to change. With this comprehensive update of the general plan, the city has the opportunity to advance its commitment to create a fair and just city, undo past harms, and address inequities through policy. I bet you're wondering why you should care about the general plan. How does it affect you? I can't think of any process that perhaps calls for a broader engagement and participation by residents and stakeholders than a general plan. There are so many aspects that touch so many parts of how we live in the community that we want to make sure that everyone's aware of this and that we think of participation across all demographics, across all the communities geographically, across all the roles that we play as members of the community, whether we're employers, workers, culture bearers, whether we are looking at how we use our space recreation, how do we engage in living in the city of So as we go through these processes and update these elements, quite literally, there is something there for everyone. It really behooves all of us to pay attention to be involved. This is just the start of the conversation. Hopefully, this video has given you a bit of insight into what Oakland's general plan planning process can do for you and all Oaklanders. Soon, we'll have more videos, press releases, website updates, and most importantly, ways for you to participate in crafting this new vision for the city. Remember, we want to hear from you. Connect with us at the web address on screen. We look forward to continuing to build Oakland together. I'm sorry, one second. Well, Diana, do you want to take it? <clears throat> yeah. Um, so you saw Bill Gilchrist, our director and um, director of the planning and building department, and also Autumn King, who's our fantastic um, public information officer. And I said that there was a question in the chat about where the video is located. And um, Lakshmi, do you, um, I know you've worked a lot on the video. Do you wanna talk, give us a little bit of like. Um, yeah. So uh, the plan is, so right now, this is, um, this is the first, like we just finalized the draft and you are the first, uh, like first group of people who have actually seen it outside of the people who, are, the staff who actually worked on it. So uh, the plan is to put it out uh, next week, uh, uh, early next week on the website. And uh, as soon as the website, uh, as soon as the video goes up on the website, um, if you if you haven't already signed up for uh, to receive general plan updates on the city's website, please do sign up. Uh, so uh, there will be an uh, email blast that goes out uh, with the announcement of the video. But the plan is to have it uh, published next week. Um, thank you, thank you, Lakshmi, and. Um... It, uh, yeah, we are looking for feedback. Autumn's definitely, um, yeah, we're all very just, you know, let us know what you think of the video because I think there's more in the hopper. Um, and so anyway, just wanted to reiterate how exciting it is to be here with y'all and um, the exciting work that you're doing. And, and thank you, Phoenix, um, again, for inviting us. Um, so some of this content may be already familiar um, you, um, to some of you who attended uh, the listening sessions that we had back in October of last year, where we really started to talk to um, stakeholders, including, you know, city staff, our city staff from all departments, um, because really the general plan touches not just the planning and building department, but the whole, every department across the city and other agencies, um, as well as community-based organizations. Um, so the first, you know, the the general plan really is an opportunity to advance our the city's mission to intentionally integrate the principle of fair in, in everything the city does in order to achieve equitable opportunities for people and for um, and communities. And this is embedded in 
co codified in our municipal code. Um, so we know that this means that we have a responsibility to really undo the harm of systemic racism by eliminating and focusing on the root causes of social inequities that we know um, are predictable by race. And um, we know then we know that we really have to start with history, that this has been a long history of that the outcomes we see today have been shaped by um, a long legacy, starting with colonialism. And um, also, we know it's important to acknowledge that we are, um, that Oakland is settled on unceded indigenous territory. And um, that Oakland also has, or not just Oakland, but that planning has a long history of shaping places where people live, work, and play in ways that have driven um, decades of growing racial inequity. And so, for example, practices like redlining um, that we talked about, that the video discussed, um, practices like exclusionary zoning that allowed wealthy homeowners across in Oakland, but also across the Bay Area and really the country to use their voting power to restrict public multifamily housing, to, um, you know, public and multifamily housing projects in their communities. Um, we are also, so we know that um, all of these practices contribute directly or indirectly to the racial disparities that we see today. Um, and what you have here on the screen is a screenshot of um, Cal Enviro screen, which um, in the, with the red shows us the communities that have the most, um, that are most burdened by environmental pollution and that also are the most vulnerable to environmental pollution due to the social um, vul vulnerabilities. Um, and we also know that these, this map is very familiar to the redlining map um, that we saw in the previous slides. Um, right, thank you, Lakshmi. Um, and yeah. um, so we know, you know that the question is then how do we start, how do we undo the harm? How will we make sure that we create a plan that can change the, and, um, these outcomes? Um, so we have tools, um, we have a number of things that we will be focusing on um, this general plan update process to really center racial equity. Um, we have tools from the Department of Race and Equity, um, for example, the racial equity impact analysis, and you heard from Phoenix about the racial equity impact analysis that was done for the ECAP. There will be also be one done for the general plan update. We also have the Inclusive Community Engagement Guide, which I'll talk about more um, uh, in a minute. Um, you may not know, but we also have, through the Department of Race and Equity, we now have these race and equity teams that are embedded in different departments. Um, so the uh, Planning and Building Department has a race and equity team, and our uh, mission is really to build internal capacity to use racial equity tools and to engage in a conversation. There is also the um, interdepartmental group that um, works on community engagement. And so their role is really to provide, again, support and capacity building to all city departments to um, improve our engagement processes and really ensure that they're inclusive. And again, we have the local local models that will we are not the general plan update will not start from scratch. Um, you've heard a lot about the East, the ECAP. Um, and so there are other initiatives that will be the foundation or the starting place to study the, for the general plan updates. And these include the healthy development guidelines the West Oakland Community Action Plan that was developed through the um, AB 617 process. Um, we also know there will be um, that um, there's a, oh, the capital improvement program that was just recently adopted. Um, and we also know that we can't do all of this alone and that we understand that we need to work, that the city needs to work in collaboration with communities 
um, to undo the legacy of racism. And that is why um, community-based organizations will play an important role in the general plan update, just like they did in the ECAP. Um, a CBO will serve as a community consultant to guide and support the development and the implementation of a community engagement process um, to inform the general plan update. Um, their role will really be to provide um, targeted engagement to, G to geographies and communities that have um, experienced um, environmental and racial inequity to ensure that their voices um, are really included and centered in the planning and policy making process. They will also advise and support the development of an overall public engagement program um, along with the prime consultant and the city and the public engagement program really articulates the values, the goals, um, performance metrics, and then um, really outlines a plan for what the community engagement process will look like. Um, this community-based organization, oh, sorry, just one more. The community-based organization will serve as a coordinating organization to then partner with other CBOs that can help us reach wide and deep. Um, and it's, yep, thank you. And so now Lakshmi is going to talk about how recent changes in state law also support the city's principles of addressing systemic inequity in the general plan update process. Thank you, Diana. So uh, state law requires us to um, adopt the housing element uh, by January, 2023 and us and any housing elements that's gonna be adopted after January, 2021 has to be accompanied with uh, an environmental justice element, which the city doesn't have yet. And also an updated safety element that looks not just at uh, hazards such as earthquake, I mean, hazards or uh, issues such as earthquakes, but also looks at uh, wildfire uh, and climate uh, impacts. <clears throat> So uh, the general plan is actually going to be uh, done in two phases. And the first phase, like I mentioned before, uh, is uh, towards uh, updating the housing element, uh, completing an environmental justice element, and also updating the safety element by January, 2023. And phase two uh, would uh, continue, until, uh, continue up to July, 2025, uh, and would update the land use, transportation, uh, and a bunch of other elements. So currently where we are in the process uh, is, so it's August right now. So in September, uh, staff will be taking their recommendations to the city council uh, for uh, the consultant teams that have ranked, uh, that have ranked first, that have been ranked first uh, through the interview process. And we will kick off the general plan update phase one. And phase one would include uh, establishing a community vision for the plan, uh, developing a land use transportation and open space framework, also uh, uh, a, a detailed, uh, not a detailed, but uh, involved community engagement process and developing the environmental justice, housing and safety elements. And all of this will be informed by a racial equity impact analysis. And we will also do uh, some simple uh, zoning code and map updates. So these will not be a this uh, in phase one, the zoning code and map update will not be a comprehensive update, but uh, will um, will mirror what uh, the environmental justice, housing, and safety elements require. And all of this will also include environmental review and compliance through the CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act process. And in January 2023, we we are hoping uh, that the council will adopt the elements and. HCD, the state uh, housing and community development department will certify the housing element, which will then make us eligible, which will make the city eligible to receive affordable housing funds. And as I mentioned before, phase two will uh, include an updated, uh, refined uh, land use transportation and open space framework and uh, updates to the land use and transportation element, the open space conservation and recreation element, the noise, historic preservation, infrastructure and facilities element, and uh, environmental review. 
uh, what this slide doesn't include is all of this will uh, be accompanied through, uh, with a, a public engagement or a community engagement process. And uh, there will be several uh, points in uh, the process, several times during the process where there will be input solicited, the draft plan will be put out and there'll be input solicited. And similar to the ECAP, we will have community town halls, but that's something that will be developed uh, uh, once the consultants come on board. So uh, to go into a little bit of detail about the housing element, so the housing element typically identifies uh, opportunity sites and identifies policies and programs that ensure uh, affordable housing is uh, built and developed within the city. So recent legislation in 2017 and 2018, uh, several bills were adopted that not just required equitable distribution of housing within a jurisdiction, so within Oakland or within the county, but also to make sure that they are uh, located in high resource areas, such as areas with, uh, with access to uh, good uh, areas with access to food sources, areas with access to good transit, areas with access to good jobs and housing and safe housing. And the new legislation also required us to locate, require cities to locate housing in a manner that uh, takes into account um, the wildfire hazard zones and climate change impacts. So uh, the safety element will incorporate uh, the local hazard mitigation plan. The, so, the, so the city recently adopted the local hazard mitigation plan, LHMP. Uh, the LHMP currently already identifies the potential natural hazards and their impacts to people, property, and the environment, and what actions can be taken to reduce those impacts. And the LHMP also includes climate change as a specific uh, topic to look at uh, sea level rise and flooding and other impacts due to climate change. I mean, even uh, increased wildfire risks are an impact of climate change. And uh, the LHMP also includes a vulnerability assessment where it looks at uh, neighborhoods in Oakland and, I, uh, and tries to quantify how vulnerable uh, these neighborhoods or these uh, areas are to um, specific um, hazards. And yeah. um, thank you, Lakshmi. The, so Senate, as you all are probably aware of, Senate Bill 1000 mandates that any municipality in California with low income communities that are, are disproportionately burdened by multiple sources of pollution and vulnerabilities, develop either an environmental justice element or um, a set of EJ policies that are then integrated into all other elements of the general plan. Now, the goal of the EJ element is really to confront and find solutions to address the compounded health risks in frontline communities by decreasing pollution exposure, increasing community assets, and really improving overall health. So there's this focus on health inequities. The first step to the sort of develop to the EJ element or um, process is to identify EJ communities. Um, and so the, the state law defines um, EJ community as a low-income community that is disproportionately burdened by pollution um, and other vulnerabilities. Um, so this has to be done prior to really beginning the planning process so that upon the completion of this, this um, sort of screening process, the location of VJ communities, as well as the nature of the environmental burdens, health risks, and needs of the community is really clearly defined and included in the general plan. Um, so reduce, let's see, the, the EJ element has a number of statutory requirements. Um, so SB 1000, SB 1000 uh, mandates that um, health risks in disadvantaged communities are addressed by um, focusing on pollution exposure and air quality, looking at um, public facilities, so really promoting facilities such as parks and community um, active transportation, infrastructure that supports like biking and walking, um, 
and um, also healthcare facilities. Um, another important topic is food access, as well as safe and sanitary homes. So there's a strong sort of connection to the housing element, um, as well as their, um, the EJ element must include community engagement policies. So policies to really promote equitable and inclusive community engagement that benefit EJ communities. Um, and there's also a focus, um, another, one other, another requirement of SB 1000 is that, um, the, uh, that we address the needs of disadvantaged communities, meaning that we need to include policies to identify and reverse sort of funding inequities, um, for example, and to really just prioritize improvements and programs that benefit EJ communities. <laughs> And now I think, yep, we have a little, um, we just want to hear from you and we have a brainstorm activity that um, Lakshmi is going to lead us through. So uh, I just posted a link in the chat. So if you can um, access that and uh, let us know uh, what issues are most important for your community for the general plan update to tackle and the second part of the question is, why do you think it's important to participate in the general plan update uh, process? And uh, what I'll do is I'll share another screen so we can uh, start seeing the responses coming in. And I will also uh, put a link to the general plan update website. Uh, Diana, do you want to put the general plan update website link in the chat? Yes. Uh, yep. So that I can share the other screen. One second. So if you can um, provide your uh, thoughts, like uh, <clears throat> And we'll give you, um, maybe we'll just take five minutes to do, uh, you know, a little bit of brainstorming. Um, if you if you don't have access, um, if you're on your phone right now and would rather just give an answer, um, please feel free to unmute and, and do that. Um, I'll be taking notes. I can't quite figure out how to add my ideas on. So I think if we just need some, um, if you click on the green plus button, that should open up a sticky and then you. Yeah, I'm sorry for um, failing to mention that. I apologize. And I see um, as far as just something caught my attention, one of the key issues is um, the lack of affordable housing above 580. Um, and um, this maybe Lakshmi, you can tell us a little yeah. bit about the fair housing requirement and the, the how that is sure. part of the housing element. So the housing element, uh, this uh, cycle, even though we are in the sixth cycle, um, there's added additional requirements from cities to look at uh, affirmative, like look at requirements that furthers, uh, that affirmatively furthers fair housing. So that requires us to not just look at sites that are in typically, like areas that are typically identified in the city, but it allows, it, it the housing element requires us to identify sites throughout the city that, uh, like I mentioned in, the, in my, uh, when I was talking about housing element, uh, high resource areas. So, for example, the uh, the lack of true affordable housing above 580 is uh, it's what is typically identified as a high resource area. But there are uh, also uh, sites that are located in 
fire hazard zone. So the, the task for us is to look at uh, how we can um, actually put in affordable housing or, or not put in, locate uh, affordable housing in uh, high resource areas and take into account um, infrastructure constraints. So what happens if a fire uh, hits uh, hillsides? Then how are we going to make sure that there's proper evacuation routes? So uh, it's going to be, uh, it's not going to be a blind, uh, identify 100 sites and then, oh yeah, we've adopted, our, we've, we've reached our housing. Um, I mean, our uh, sites, uh, the, I'm sorry, the arena numbers that we need to the regional housing allocation numbers that uh, the number of housing units that the city is uh, required to um, provide in the next eight years, but it is actually going to take a look at what kind of areas these uh, sites are in. Are they in areas that are low poverty or are they in high resource areas? Well, how does the access to food, like how is access to food? How is access to safe uh, spaces? How is access to transit? How is access to park? So it's uh, actually requiring us to look at um, the sites inventory in a holistic manner. And uh, uh, and um, again, like uh, the EJ element, like with the EJ element, it also requires us to uh, conduct uh, inclusive community engagement. So that's how the EJ element and the housing kind of goes hand in hand because most of the uh, issues that we are looking at are the same, one and the same. And I know we have um, about five minutes left in our time. And does anyone want to um, volunteer to share their thoughts? Um, or if you see something on the board that resonates with you, um, or we can open it up for questions at this point as well. Yeah. So it's uh, two fifty six p.m. So it's around uh, the five minutes that we were talking about is done. So do Phoenix, do you want to uh, move into questions or do you want to keep the board running? Uh, let's move into questions and see. And I will share the like I will export these uh, the, the sticky notes as a PDF or a Excel spreadsheet and send. I'll share them with you. Okay. Along with our PowerPoint. Are there any questions? Hi, my name is Mitzi. Um, Hi. could you say more about the transportation? Like, do you work with transportation agencies and you know, they predict their future plans too, or how does that work? Are the transportation corridors something that come after this? Uh, yeah. So uh, Diana, I can try to answer it and then you can, uh, so we can tag team this. So, so the transportation agencies that are, uh, that uh, work in Oakland, are, I think AC Transit and then BART. So they are uh, their own independent entities, but uh, whenever they do uh, corridor planning or whenever they have to uh, include new routes or new uh, new routes, uh, like for example, the BRT, the bus rapid transit line, they do work with the city to um, identify how uh, the placement of bus stops. So they don't work with planning and building, but they work with um, the Oakland Department of Transportation, OCDOT, to identify what improvements need to be made and um, how it's going to be in integrated, how that road is going to be in integrated, for instance, with an already existing an existing plan that the city is working on. I think, yeah. Diana, do you want to add anything to that? Um, no, I think there's a really good, good, and I mean, I that was a really good answer. There will be a. Um, as part of the first phase of the general plan update, we'll, we, we will be developing a um, transportation land use and transportation framework, um, as well as the phase two will include a transportation and land use element, because that is a required element. Um, and so part of the 
um, part of the like technical analysis that happens is to make sure that there's coordination between plans uh, that you know transportation other transportation agencies outside of the city create um, and so part of our role is to engage really the staff and coordinate with the staff from other agencies as well as with our own um, department of transportation so uh, part of you know we part of that analysis is making sure that the plans for example that oakdot has already um, you know like the east oakland mobility action the mobility plan um, is reflected like again like we we're not starting from scratch that though that those planning processes are places to start from so we are looking for for gaps to address in the general plan update and again the general plan update is a the general plan is a um 20 it's a long range it's a long it looks into the future 25 years so it's asking you know in 25 years from now where does oakland want to be what is um how do we we are looking at the conditions now and saying you know what are the steps we need to take to get to where we want to be as a city um, in 25 years from now and also considering all of the state all of our, the requirements that the state has around um, planning for housing, for example, and also for addressing environmental justice, and also for addressing um, like the requirements in the safety element around um, hazards and climate change. Not, so I'll stop there. because. Yeah. Um, and uh, so to add to what Diana said, and this kind of relates to what Phoenix presented with the ECAP. So it will also coordinate closely, or it will also align closely with the ECAP about reducing greenhouse gas emissions because vehicular uh, transportation and vehicular emissions are a huge source for local uh, emissions in the city or in any city. So it would look at uh, reducing vehicle miles traveled and uh, increasing, uh, uh, there's this new, uh, so increasing middle housing, uh, improving, uh, uh, safety, so uh, safety from uh, traffic accidents. So it will look at uh, all of those uh, policies and uh, programs that further those policies. Thank you. Okay, so we're up on three o'clock right now. Lakshmi Diana, thank you so much for that presentation, for joining us today. Really appreciate that. I think, uh, yeah, we're looking forward to seeing that video come out because I think one of the things we can do is just maybe just spread it around and get people looking at that more. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having us and for giving us the space to talk about this project. I know we are starting out fresh, so it's, it's actually uh, really good to meet you and uh, talk, present to you every present everybody. Yeah, like, yeah, ditto. Um, thank you uh, also for sharing your thoughts with us. And um, we're excited to see, learn more about the work you do. Um, so I know we'll be um, engaging closely. So uh, it was great to meet y'all. Thank you, Phoenix. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. You too. Bye.